uh, there's only one of me. That makes <laughs> that makes it easier on everybody. <laughs> uh, I I wanted to um, say how happy I am to be at McNally Jackson with the incomparable Dune Arbus, and um, I have just a few words to say about her um, book and uh, and its effect on me. Um, so Dune, if you if you can't stand it, you can uh, turn my your volume can down. <laughs> you can turn your volume down. <laughs> but um, it is uh, it is my very great pleasure this evening to introduce Dune Arbus to patrons of Man McNally Jackson and beyond. I believe this is Dune's first appearance as herself, which is to say, as the author of her own work, a singular work. I stress this singularity because for many years. Dune has had a very lively career as a critic and curator and playwright, all occupations that essentially involve other people. Which brings us to her new book, her first novel, The Caretaker. I won't give too much away because I want you to buy this handsome, dense, and moving book, splendidly published by New Directions, a book that says so much or implies so much about what that kind of career in sharing means. Set for the most part in a building like no other, Dune's novel gives voice to the backstory behind legend. The cast is small but fully realized. In effect, it's an ensemble that gathers around absence and what the offstage protagonist, so to speak, has left, left them with and left them with and their imaginations. I keep saying I will say no more about this book. You should read it for yourselves, but I find myself wanting to talk about it and talk about it and talk to Dune about it. So I welcome this public occasion to talk to, learn from, amuse the very brave Dune Arbus. I don't think I've ever been called brave before, but I'll take it. <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> it's my job to categorize, categorize you <laughs> characterize you as I see fit, just like, just like, uh, well, it, it grows out of deep feeling and respect, Dune. Likewise. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I think I'm just going to, I'm going to ask you a bunch of questions that I've never been able to muster in um, over lemon pasta at Alto Paradiso. Um, and your writing has always meant so much to me. And my first experience of it was in 1978 in Rolling Stone, when you published um, a, an incredible piece about Peter Beard. It remains one of the best pieces about photography I've ever read. And subsequently, or and the same year, you published an inc amazing piece in The Nation on Walker Evans. And um, I've been doing my research and I'm wondering about your start as a writer. You began as a journalist. Did this idea of criticism on the one hand and profiles about living artists on the other, did you see a split in that? Or were you interested in both kinds of writing early on? A lot of your early pieces were about people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think in the very beginning, of what we can uh, what we can call my career, um, I was very very interested and absorbed by the way other people put words together. Mm -hmm. So a lot of what I wrote depended very much on the structure of their language and the twists and turns within a sentence and. Uh, and at the start, I, I had a very good memory, which I have since gotten rid of. <laughs> uh, and part of the reason I believe that I have gotten rid of it is because I started using a tape recorder at some point. Yes. And uh, that replaced my mind. <laughs> yes. Um, so that's a that and that has that's a whole sort of other wrinkle story um but i don't think i ever thought of um criticism and and
and whatever you called the other thing. I'd say profiles. They were the profiles, profiles as really different, or maybe I just didn't think in those terms. Yes. Uh, I mean, P the piece about Peter Beard, I would say, was the first time I discovered a, a voice to tell something in that I could trust. Mm -hmm. It was it was distant enough, and yet informed enough and i was really sick of anything that talked about the first person yes i mean if that first person was me right. uh, <laughs> uh, yes that you didn't want to that you the form of uh, that piece is so incredible because the form of it really is very intimate but it is about uh, the intimacy is in the language as opposed to a description of the relationship between you and Beard. Right. And, I, I and, tried to keep that way out of it because yes. I found being with him really stressful. Yeah. <laughs> and I got very uh, fond of him mm -hmm. when I was away from him. Mm -hmm. So that partly dictated what the voice was. And I, I think you know how essential that thing of finding or falling into a way to tell something is. Yes. Without it, you're just lost. You can't go anywhere. Yes. And when you find it, you're not necessarily free, but, but at least you're a little liberated from casting about and <laughs> partly drowning yes. your own inarticulateness. Yes. And I think that one of the things that I loved about those pieces, um, and Dune has also written an incredible piece about James Brown that's in the James Brown Reader, by the way, folks, you can get it <laughs> online. And it's a wonderful um, evocation of a man who really is a force of nature. And, you know, he has all of the surround the trappings, I would say, of a star, but there's something incredibly indefinable about him as a, as a being. And mm -hmm. I think that Dune captures energy um, better than a lot of other writers. And um, it's essential to the profile writing process that you understand the essence of that person. So I was wondering um, about, I'm working my way sort of backwards and then we'll move forward, but I was wondering about your education and you have very strong ideas that come through in The Caretaker, particularly, and other books um, devoted to photography about the use of language um, and the ways in which you want to use language. And I was just wondering about, having known that you grew up in New York, what was your education like and were you a, a reader as a kid? I was a bit of a reader, but I, I wouldn't say I was a profound reader mm -hmm. um, and I had a very bifurcated education. I began my education at Rudolf Steiner which went through ninth grade mm -hmm. which was full of um, I don't even know how to describe it um, mystical implications mm -hmm. all around you mm -hmm. uh, and everything had a meaning in and of itself this may sound like the book in a way uh yeah. in and of itself and yet at the same time beyond itself yes uh and there were codes and there were things you needed to know and i guess one of the better examples is that until you got to ninth grade, you, you could only paint with yellow, red, and blue. Yeah. <laughs> and you had to do it in that order, yellow, yeah. red, blue. Yeah. And so all the Rudolf Steiner paintings looked the same. <laughs> so I came from this, what, what seemed like a very insular 
world as far as education goes, although the rest of my life was much more interesting. Um, I mean, open um, to Rudolph's, to um, Elizabeth Irwin. Yes. Where everybody was out picketing on the weekends. Yeah. <laughs> it was all, you know, the world. They were in the world. Yes. Um, so these two things never quite came together. <laughs> <laughs> and you were a little bit um, ideologically at sea, but by, by the time you finished right. high school. And actually, I've developed a great belief in ambivalence. Yeah. <laughs> I held it all together. That's wonderful. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that because both your parents are art, were artists, that the Rudolf Steiner School, um, I've had friends whose kids go there and they're not, a, they're not taught to read until a certain age. You learn to break bed and to do yes, things with your hands. Was it? History, they, they teach you myths. Uh, so all, all the history I know is, you know, Greek myths. <laughs> yes. And does it, do them being parent, um, them being parents, them being artists, does it, did you feel that the influence of that kind of freedom allowed you to pursue writing as something? Did, it, did writing come to you as a... Uh, I wouldn't say, I think it's your vocation, really. I'm going to use that word and scare you. But um, <laughs> it is your vocation. Do you think that your, your becoming an artist had something to do with them being artists and their influence as artists? I don't think I either dare or possibly even want to think particularly of myself or either of them yeah. as that. Yeah, <laughs> they, they're just the, the folks, right? <laughs> yeah, they're just plain folk. <laughs> <laughs> and tell me, what were the first what were the first um, forays into writing for you? Oh, there was, I the, think there was I the sub, wrote... there was the Sunday Tribune, which doesn't exist anymore. Yeah, and what went through many incarnations of being the Sunday magazine of various different newspapers who kept getting gobbled up by other newspapers till yes. they gobbled the whole thing away. Yeah. Um, uh, I was about to answer you by telling you that uh, when I was about four, I dictated a version of the Bible. I thought that's what you were looking for. <laughs> um, no, no, I. I, I didn't know anything about that. Please <laughs> right, elucidate. <laughs> there was a better version out there. <laughs> That's wonderful. So it's 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 a wonderful thing that you know what they call born writers. They just born writers want to write the book that they want to read. And um, we're going to get into a little bit more chrono chronological stuff a little bit. But I wanted to come back to this idea of absence um, in mm -hmm. The Caretaker and how so many people gather around um, what this man has left them, which are these fragments about himself. You've also written a play um, that had something to do with this um, idea too, the um, third door to the right um, is um, a man recounting a, a relationship. With the fame. Yes, an interviewer comes yes. uh, to uh, interview him about a friend of his who's died. Who's died and who was um, well known. Do you, this, I love this, I love this um, absent fame as a trope, um, that the lingering legacy of both of these men have everything to do with what we make up about them mm. and what, based on what they've left which might not even be as great as what we feel and think. Yes, and, I, think, I, I think we had this conversation about your curating James Baldwin's. Well, it's, 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 it's something that I didn't think about for myself so much um, this time around, rereading The Caretaker and noticing that some of these chapters kill me because they always end with silence. 
<laughs> um, they end up with they end up with silence as a sound, and the resonance of silence as a way for the person to. And you don't elaborate on this, but we know the reader that they're. It allows them to think, but it, it's about reflection. But it's also about trying to define who they are, in relation to absence. Um, it's it, it's a wonderful book to reread because then you see all of the things that you missed, gobbling it up the first time. And I wondered about the genesis of the caretaker, the novel. I. I, was I hope that's not too long and elaborate. But. You mean my answer or your question? <laughs> my question. <laughs> no, I love your long questions. Okay. Um, I, I, was, uh, I was in the process of writing, I thought, and maybe I'll think about it again, uh, a very long, ambitious, complicated, multi-character book. Mm -hmm. And one of the characters was in service to an institution and had been there for a long time through many changes of administration. Mm -hmm. And this was something that sort of grabbed my interest. Mm -hmm. And I fancied I could um, go write a short story about this character or some permutation of a character like this. And then I'd go back to my big book and many years passed. <laughs> and I found that I hadn't written a short story. I'd written a short novel. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and you know, that other thing is waiting somewhere out there, maybe. Was it, um, the, um, the play was produced in 2003. Um, had you worked on it prior to that for a long time or? The play? Yes. Uh, third floor, second door on the, the right. To the right, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I wrote that much quicker than I wrote this book mm -hmm. uh, in around 1973. And oh, it was wow. produced as a play till when you, whenever you said it was. Which... 2003 and your, your sister um, directed it. Yeah, right. And, um, My father was in it. Yeah. Yes. What was that like to hear your language on stage? And what is it like to see your language in a book? Oh, those are so completely different things. The stage thing was um, wonderful because it, maybe maybe these are similar, because it became something so different. Mm -hmm. from what I had written. And I thought the play was much better than what I had actually written, which was a, a monologue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and as a monologue, it was based very much on my experience interviewing people mm -hmm. and their self-propelled desire to tell you something. Mm -hmm. Uh, so the interviewer was completely silent yes. <laughs> and the man couldn't stop talking. Yes. This worked much better when there was a real person there, I thought, as the interviewer, yes. um, giving him his motive to speak. Um, as for this book, um, I guess I've had a similar experience since it's been published, because I hear it in other people's voices, or they react to it in ways that didn't occur to me, or I'm free, which is great, to think of it as a, as a stranger, as a kind of another reader of yeah. it. Yes, and because the person who writes the book, by the time the book comes out, you're a different person. Well, I don't know that I've shed it entirely. <laughs> <laughs> would you would you would you share some of this beautiful language with us now? Yes. Thank you. I think that means I need to open a book. Yes. 
Do you want to set it up, Jane? Or? I suppose I should say a little something. So uh, the caretaker, who obviously is the central figure of this book from which it gets its name, um, was in his youth very, very gifted or seemed to be very gifted in many different ways. A phenomenon that left him sort of horrified. And he has spent a good deal of his life trying to escape from the possibilities of inherent in his nature, let's say. Mm -hmm. Uh, and in the course of that, he's become an expatriate, uh, taking on lots of different jobs, none of which would touch on what he was really good at. Yes. And uh, maybe that's all I need to say because I, I think, think, so. I think so. talking about the I agree. I agree. Other character. I agree. If you were raised on the classics and have come to believe in fate, you might say that the caretaker's fate embraced him 25 years earlier on a chilly winter evening in a rooming house in Prague when bending over a stack of discarded English language newspapers waiting to be crumpled into fuel, he chanced upon the following headline. Dr. Charles A. Morgan, chemist, author, philosopher, and collector, dies at 66. As the caretaker later recounted the event to the hiring committee, he fixated on these words for several minutes, reading and rereading them in a futile attempt to amend the stated facts. News of the death of an intimate could not have been more shattering to his sense of equilibrium in his student days, he had encountered his intellectual lodestar in Morgan's seminal volume, Stuff, an experience that marked him forever. He discovered in the book many of his own inchoate thoughts expressed in the words of a kindred spirit. In fact, such an affinity existed between the writer's psyche and his own that it often seemed as if a sentence on the page and its echo in his mind had sprung into being simultaneously, leaving him incapable of distinguishing the conjurer from the conjured. The book had become, in a sense, his Bible. It accompanied him everywhere. Although his relationship to its author was, of course, entirely one-sided, it remained nonetheless solely responsible for his feeling less alone in the world. Mm -hmm. it's, I love um, that part. <laughs> I love all parts. And um, <laughs> this, this idea of loneliness um, is, is incredibly moving to me. And I just wanted to read um, back to you a little short passage from the very end of the book. Mm. Um, which really kind of, to me, sums up um, the silence that I was talking about earlier. And um, anyway, he goes to sleep. <laughs> and, <laughs> and Dune writes, we, must, we too must wait. Is it possible that while he lingers in the vast, uncharted region between here and elsewhere, between now and nevermore, between himself, the other, and no one at all, some inchoate form of consciousness persists to helplessly record with, uh, with no interpretation, the most ephemeral of sensations, not pain, too late for that, not pleasure, maybe just the pure phenomenon of air drifting over un unprotected flesh and moving on, or the celestial vision of brightly colored flashing lights emanating from somewhere deep inside his eyes as they regurgitate the light they once absorbed expunging what they'd seen. I'm going to skip down. Mind the barrier, touching is forbidden. Inside a mind, a door is slowly closing, although it makes no sound, con er, no sound. Consciousness, that old, incessant narrator, fills silent, falls silent, 
the privacy he craves envelops him. There is at least nothing left for anyone to know, not even the omniscient, only the exquisite neutrality of science. I would say that's pretty good. <laughs> I'll accept that. It sounded and, great. <laughs> and the reason that and the reason that it is so moving to me, and this goes back to both of our earlier jobs as reporters, is that at a certain point, if you're going to write um, like this, you can't really listen mm -hmm. like that. You can't listen to the other person's story because you're involved. I'm gonna hold it up so they buy it. You're mm -hmm. involved in creating something like this. You can't do both. Um, I remember distinctly, I was doing a lot of reporting and one day, truly, my ear started to bleed, my left ear. Really? It was, it was, it was like something out of Pasolini. It was bizarre. <laughs> and I knew that I couldn't listen in that way anymore. So when you were talking earlier about memory, having a great memory that got sort of um, lost by recording, I went back to the, all the amazing books that you did with Richard Avedon in the 60s and... Mm -hmm and the wonderful um, book on Alice in Wonderland, Andre Gregory. Those books are about listening to other creators. Yes. Um, I, I think, I don't think you could have come to this without having done that first and understood that you didn't want to do that anymore. You wanted to do this. <laughs> so this book has a lot of um, primal energy to me and primacy, and I'm wondering, were there writers that you got incredible sustenance from while you were working on this book? Sometimes I find it difficult to read real voices while I'm working on something long. I, I read biographies and the news and so on because it's about the mm -hmm. narrative, it's not about voice. But I'm wondering if you were finding sustenance while you were working on this book, literary sustenance. I mainly think back to, um, and it's, it's sort of individual books that may not be even similar to one another. Um, I guess, I mean, Absalom, Absalom, I think is the most glorious, miraculous piece of um, ventriloquism. Yes. Uh, where the voices are are part of a chorus and they slip in and out of each other and you don't see how it's happening or when it's happening. Yes. Uh, I, I find it transporting. I, I don't think I really want to read it again, but, but yeah. I say this from my reading of long ago and it's very much with me. Um, Did it give you a sense of freedom of what the form, the form could do? Yeah. Absolutely, yes. I mean, I don't know if I, I'm sh I read while I was writing this, but I, I don't really remember what I was reading. I think that's, that's, a, that's a wonderful thing because um, you don't want them crowding in on your mind while you're doing something like this. You, the career, your career prior to it has been about, and I meant it in the introduction, it's about um, it's been about collaborating with other people. Yeah. And when you make this decision to, to create a work of fiction, um, and you have a wonderful line in the, in the book um, where you say, basically there's a rhetorical question you said, and you say, impossible to tell, this is fiction. <laughs> and it's a, wonderful, it's a wonderful pause to remind us that this is a work of creation. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I think is fascinating about it is that there are really, the big events have happened before the story, except for the crumbling of the meteorite. There's, you know, there's, there's, the big events have happened already. So yeah, the time, you slow down time greatly in this book um, so that objects, places, people are described. Um, in great detail and it has an effect on the reader's sense of time um, and it begins to uh, and we begin to understand what the caretaker has lived based no, on the language mm. based on the language um, this kind of 
um, there's a wonderful, and I don't remember the book very well, but I, Peter Hanke, a book called Slowness, and everything sort of becomes glacial. Hmm. And I felt that when I was reading your book, there was um, this little trickle. It starts with a little trickle, and then it becomes a tiny little river, a little, and then it sort of spreads out but very, very slowly. Was that intentional to have the details and time um, or help to shape the sense of time in the book? Uh, I can't say that almost anything was intentional. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that may sound like a denial of responsibility, but I don't, and I don't mean it was all just, you know, around me like uh, <laughs> like Greek myths <laughs> uh, but, but uh but in some way I I feel like being blind to what you're doing is incredibly important or at least important to me yes uh and and so my focus was very narrow mm. it was and the, the details seemed in incredibly important to me. I kept thinking there wasn't enough of them. <laughs> uh, and my focus was totally on the sentence I was in or possibly at times the paragraph mm -hmm. and the demands, uh, imperious demands of that sentence saying, uh, you know, it can't end here. It needs, usually what it needed was a kind of an alibi Mm -hmm. uh, or a reversal against itself or something. I, mm -hmm. I told you I'm, <laughs> I believe in ambivalence or yeah. have it. Um, so, but, so I think. I think that, I don't, I don't think it's ambivalence, Dune. I think that it's kind of a healthy skepticism. Oh, okay, I'll take that. <laughs> <laughs> it's a I'll different thing. <laughs> ambivalence is just like, you know, you're just sitting around not doing anything. <laughs> so, but skepticism is being engaged. And it's a book about you're engaged in the book. Yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, every piece of something yes. was, I was totally in there with it and yes. meant it. But I might at a moment say the opposite and mean it just as much yes. that's what i mean yes can you would you would you bless us with another reading from this it's really like a long poem to me i can listen to it all day uh. <laughs> it's, just, it's just the sound of the words you know when he first accepted the position as the morgan foundation's caretaker in residence and promised them five years. He may have envisioned it as little more than the latest in a continuing series of respites from his own life. He must have relished the prospect of inhabiting this sanctuary, one he had never even anticipated visiting other than in his imagination. A sanctuary, however temporary, in which to polish someone else's silver to house rare manuscripts in plastic sleeves, to rehabilitate a broken stool or damaged artifact, to replace labels for displays, to wrest order from disorder, and to share with strangers to whatever degree his eloquence permitted, his hard-won understanding of the meaning of Dr. Morgan's singular achievement. On several occasions in the course of the ensuing 24 years, he had tendered his resignation, only to be persuaded to withdraw it each time, inadvertently securing in the process salary increases to which he remained indifferent and binding himself in exchange to additional ever lengthening terms of commitment. His departure has been eradicated as an option by his repeated failed attempts to effectuate it. He got the job, now the job has him. A trap partially of his own making is closing round him, holding him fast. And so today, like yesterday, 
and like so many other yesterdays that he has lost count and even forgotten when it was he lost it, he once more leads a steadily dwindling little band of visitors up the staircase he first climbed as an innocent applicant for a position that is now the very essence of his identity. He is the caretaker of the foundation, Dr. Morgan's man, a hired hand of sorts, so safely ensconced within his role that his capacity to excel at anything else has ceased to be a threat. He is here solely to make the dead man come alive. It has become a consuming preoccupation. His work is never done. On the surface, the caretaker betrays scarcely any awareness of an impending threat. He has cultivated a willful blindness to the ongoing machinations concerning the museum's uncertain future and by extension his own, performing his duties as diligently as if nothing had changed, as if in the face of his calm persistence, nothing ever would. Had there been a witness to take note of his demeanor when he mounted a step stool in the library, dust cloth in hand, to minister to the books that lined the top shelf, or sat at the workbench in his room, copying out the text from one of Morgan's ledgers onto three by five cards in his studious penmanship, or set about dismantling an installation untouched for decades, one subject at a time, the green beetles, for example, or the tarnished silver spoons, to make way for a new installation unavailable to visitors until now. His fixed trance-like smile, the tilt of his head, the pursed lips through which a tuneless song escaped, might have implied a peculiar serenity, a serenity reserved exclusively for those who having waged a long, futile battle against despair, have finally befriended it, and with a sigh verging on relief, abandoned their last vestiges of hope. The board could not be blamed for failing to recognize in this dutiful, mild-mannered employee, the dangerously single-minded enemy it was harboring unwittingly within the foundation walls. I'm not going to give away that how much I love the widow, by the way. <laughs> yes, I didn't read anything about the widow. I know you love the widow. I love, I love her, but I, and I love the book because it says a lot about, um, it's really, to me, a, a very moving book about connection. Mm. And you don't actually have to have the person there. <laughs> right. <laughs> connect with them and to have them change your life. And um, that is among the many layers of the book that are so um, profound and worth every rereading and reading again um, to learn about the soul of this writer, Dune Arvis. And I'm so grateful to her for having written it. And um, if, you can, if you can bear it, Dune, I know that there are some people who would like to ask you questions. I, we speak with great confidence, but writers are often very shy and like to lie down. So. <laughs> oh, do I get to lie down now? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I hope you can bear with us. And, Again, thank you so much for, for taking the time and being so open. And, and then I have to thank you for being here with me and giving me the, the courage. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. <laughs> okay, Maris is back and she's um, fielding some questions for you, Dune. Well, Dune, the good news and the bad news is that we don't have any questions in the chat. So, oh, I see all these that, people look, looking. Yay! Yeah, everybody's looking. So if you want to take a moment and uh, get a question in right now, then we can let Dune go. <laughs> okay. Oh, a question from me or? If, sure. 
Oh, um, June, I always, um, this is a very irritating question, but um, having- Can I give you an irritating answer? Yes, yes. <laughs> having, written, having written the book, published the book, and um, does it, we were t you were talking about Faulkner earlier and I was talking about his elasticity and form. Yeah. Does the work that you're doing now, fiction-wise, has the has the caretaker allowed you to move forward in ways that you couldn't have even expected prior to publishing the book? I don't know. I don't know what's in my future in that regard. Okay. Um, but I do have to say that the fact that this book um, exists in this form is very significantly thanks to Hilton oh. and to someone else who um, got it to New Directions, which is the best damn publisher <laughs> I could have dreamed of. And I think that sounds sort of like, you know, an Academy Award plug, but I couldn't leave without saying it. No, Barbara Epler is a <laughs> Barbara Epler is an exemplary publisher and reader, and there was no work to be done. All one, all one had, all one was doing was saying, "Here, read this." <laughs> um, so I think Maris has a question, actually. Yeah, I think uh, we, we've gotten some questions in the chat. This one is from Harry Mark. I would like to know from Dune, what inspired you to write this book? Oh. God. <laughs> God, God did. <laughs> God did, yes, oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you, God. Um, uh, probably in some way, uh, in some very mysterious way, probably a lifetime and uh, combined with a yearning and, uh, and patience and diligence and, and enough time passing so that I didn't have to be literal about anything. Yes. Siddhartha asks, how do you think writers can keep protecting productive in such troubling times? I'm not sure it's any different from any of the other times. I mean, how on earth do they stay productive, period? Yeah. I don't have a better answer, I'm sorry. <laughs> Mary asks, did finishing this book and seeing it published give you a sense that the caretaker's story is finished? Or will we see his return in another story? Oh, that's a wonderful question. Oh no, he's, he's finished. <laughs> um, and, uh, and I may just be getting started, who knows? That's right. Mm -hmm. That's that's it from the comments. So if if we'd like to oh, wrap up, you. yeah. Thank you, Maris and and Dune. Honestly, thank you again for putting yourself out there in so many beautiful ways. And thank you for luring me out once again. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll talk to you soon. All right. Bye, everybody. Thank bye. you. Bye, bye. bye. <laughs>